item and enemy randomizers. After years of watching my favourite Souls creators try them and loving every single second of the chaos that follows, I figured it was about time to try out one myself. You can set up a randomizer to be as forgiving or as brutal as you like. I wanted to do a playthrough relatively similar to my build guides, where I mainly focus on just the major bosses. But to give myself a bit of a challenge, I thought I'd also add in a small percentage chance of standard enemies becoming major bosses, meaning occasionally I might see some of the big bosses in the overworld. And if this experience has taught me one thing, it's that I fucking suck at setting up randomizers. So first up, I had to choose from my randomized starting classes. There were many cool options, but there was one that was just a no brainer. Any playthrough where you're likely to encounter some big health bars early, the absolute best weapons you could hope for is either of the black flame weapons or the rot ones. And the vagabond class had the rotten crystal sword. Before I'd even got up to Limgrave, I found some new fashion. And when you look this good before the game's even started, you know it's going to be a good run. So what have we got? Okay, that's Putrid Avatar. Is that... That's, um... Fire Giant and Rykard. That's funny. I thought I'd set this up so the major bosses were only a 10%... Is that... I'm beginning to think I might have messed up the settings on this randomizer. So to get set up for this run, I just explored Limgrave a bit. My original plan was to do this run region locked, but that didn't work out for reasons that will become obvious later. But also, with every item in the game randomized, there's not much point in exploring later areas, as there's no guarantee of finding anything useful. Limgrave was really relaxing and chill. Not much going on here at all. Now I'd set up the randomizer so that keys and important items would be placed in important locations, such as Sacred Tier and Golden Seed locations as well as major bosses and merchants. You can have everything completely randomized, but that would mean that something important, like the rolled medallion, could be behind an illusory wall in an obscure catacombs, meaning it would be a very long playthrough. So I rode around Limgrave, going to all of these locations. And... Blimey, he's had a few. Now, in my exploration, I had found pretty much all of the most powerful sorceries in the game, along with the Imp Tear, the Graven School Talisman, and the Magic Scorpion Charm. So I had the makings of a monstrous Imp build, I just needed to find a staff. I'd also found the Death's Poker, the most broken weapon in the entire game. And if I hadn't done a run with that very recently, this would have been a very easy randomizer. And happily, I'd found the Thops Barrier, Ash of War, in Selen's shop, so parries with my medium shield were on the menu. Satisfied that I'd got everything important in Limgrave, it was time for the first boss. Right, Phase 2 Fire Giant. While Margit's Arena probably isn't the worst place in the game to fight this guy, it's certainly not the best. 
dodging this attack is... Yeah. So I jumped back to the round table, and at the twin maiden husks, found the Prince of Death's Cyst. I've literally never seen this before in the main game, but it gives extra vitality, so I equipped it. This was my only talisman for the majority of the game. I'd also found Black Knife Teach, and while I never usually use summons, I was prepared to make an exception for Fire Giant. Alas, I had nowhere near enough FP to use him. And this was the end of the summons idea. So I had to fight Fire Giant straight up, and this was a pretty long and stressful fight. Thankfully, when he did the breath attack here, I was able to tank it and then just get out of the AoE. After a while, and thanks to some heavy lifting from my rot sword, I got him. Then it was time to run through Stormvale without getting hit. Godric was a Dragonkin soldier, and I was initially quite pleased about this, but there was a bit of a problem. Every time I got him to phase two, he'd get confused and think he was the Knight's Cavalry, and promptly yeet himself off the cliff. He could do this at any stage of the long phase two, and he didn't deload, meaning that this fight couldn't be finished unless I could kill him in phase one. And as this wasn't an option with my damage, I had no choice but to head to Leonia without those extra levels. Now Leonia is interesting. To get into Rhea Lucaria, we need the Glintstone Key. And in this randomizer, it could have been anywhere in Leonia's important locations. So I first went to all of these and checked in on all of the merchants, but no key. At this point, I'd seen most of the major bosses out in the open, but there were a couple of notable exceptions. And while riding up the west coast, I spotted something down in the lake. The cool thing about a wild Melania is that once you kill her and think she's gonna bug out because she has no death animation, she immediately transitions to phase two. So every instance of her is a two phase fight. She's the only boss that does this. And sadly, that means that there weren't any wild phase two Melanias in this randomizer. She also appeared far less frequently than the other bosses. While I saw literally hundreds of all of the others, I only bumped into Melania half a dozen times in the overworld. So at this point, there were only a couple of places the Academy Key could be, and one of them was whatever boss was in Caria Manor. So I headed up to find that Loretta had been replaced with something far more dangerous. Unlike the real Horaloo, in a randomizer, he has a gigantic full health bar and can't be bullied around nearly as much requiring a lot more concentration. Despite a reasonable performance, I threw it at the end. But luckily, I had the rock. And he didn't drop the key. And this was a big problem, because that meant there was only one place left in Leonia it could be. Magma Worm Makar. Obviously, him being the gatekeeper to Altus Plateau means that he scaled higher than everything else in Leonia. And I would have to fight whatever was in his arena 
at a much lower level than usual, having not killed Godric or been to Rhea Lucaria yet. And I just knew it would be something absolutely awful. So I strapped myself in for what I knew would be a whole bunch of pain, suffering. Oh, that's the key. Never mind. Forgot about that one. Rare Lucaria was super casual. In fact, at times, it was hard to tell that I was even playing a randomizer. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you will know that I was pretty confident on my way to Red Wolf, because whatever was in his arena, I was probably much better at fighting it than I am Red Wolf. Well, I wasn't wrong, but Radagon already? He was a lot tankier than Red Wolf. But I know Radagon pretty well, so this wasn't too bad. Now for Anala. And I'm just going to let you watch what the run up to the lift was like. Then, after that joy, there was Whip Guy, the most dangerous NPC in the game. Who could one-shot me? Several quit-outs later, I was up to the arena. And it's Rykard. Now the good news is that you get the Serpent Hunter on entering. And also in Limgrave, I'd found the Lance for power stancing. The bad news is that this is what the camera looked like fighting him in this arena. Some attacks of his were one-shots, so I just had to hope that I didn't get hit. So after a horrendous run up to the boss room and a fight that was mostly up to luck, hopefully I can kill this second boss first try. Yeah. I started this randomizer so I could have some new experiences in Elden Ring and Dying continuously on the stairs, getting memed by Whip Guy on the lift, dying to attacks that I physically couldn't see from Rykard, and when I made it through all of that and correctly swapped all of my weapons and armor in a two second gap at the end of the Rykard fight, fighting these nerds in an arena where I could get trapped on an invisible wall whilst trying to dodge a poison cloud certainly was a new experience. And after two hours of constant screaming, I decided that I'd rather go to Altus at level 30 than attempt it one more time. But there was another problem with that. I hadn't found either of the Dectus medallion halves, and I didn't want to do the ruin strewn precipice because of Magma One. So I wondered whether the third way might work. I knew it wouldn't be an abductor, but would dying to the enemy at the bottom of Rhea Lucaria get me to Volcano Map? So I headed down through the caves, which was interesting. With Grace lit, all I had to do was pop down to the boss room. Some time later, I made it into the abductors arena to find the Shade, who very fortunately didn't have a lot of health. So, Altus. Once again, I ran around and grabbed everything in all of the important locations. 
but none of it was that useful. My biggest problem at this point was the lack of sacred tears. I was having to heal twice for pretty much every hit that I took, and even in Altus, I'd only found enough for a plus two flask. Happily, I did find a somber six here, meaning I could get my weapon to plus six, and although I didn't know it at the time, I wouldn't be upgrading my weapon further for a while. I went to check out the Draconic Tree Sentinel and got what I felt was the first bit of luck in this run. It was an avatar, an incredibly tanky, hard hitting one, but an avatar nonetheless. But here's the problem. I needed two great runes to go any further and I couldn't fight either of the demigods in Limgrave or Leonia. So first I thought I'd head to Kaelid to see what Radan's fight was like. I absolutely loved how this fight looked in Radan's arena. And if you thought I was kidding in the last video when I talked about burning all of my heals in the first 20 seconds of a fight, then not getting hit for three minutes, this fight was an example of just that. And he didn't drop a great rune. Now at this point, I was starting to wonder if this run was actually doable. Even if I suffered through the gargoyles in Rayo Lucaria, that would only give me one of the two great runes I needed for Lane Dell. But on my way up to Volcano Manor, I found what might be a possible solution. The Blood Knight's Medal. I'd be way too low level to go here on a standard playthrough, but if Moog was an easy boss like Godric, I could go get a whole bunch of late game runes and level up enough for the Gargs and the Big Knight's Cavalry. I figured it was worth a shot. And anyone who's been to Mogwin's palace before can probably predict the problem in getting up to the palace. Yeah. Now, Elden Beast looks imposing here, but he's not actually the problem because he's not aggroed. However, standing behind him is a fire giant, a moog and a red wolf, all of which were aggroed. Fire giant would hit me out of nowhere. And if he didn't, moog and wolf would gank me. After quite a lot of trial and error though, I figured out a strat. I parried or backstabbed the banished knight to give Elden Beast some time to get out of the way. Then, got past Elden Beast and quit out next to Moog. This quit out gave me just enough time to avoid Fire Giant, so I only had to deal with Moog and Wolf. Soon as I was clear, another quit out. This process took a while, but eventually I made it up to the palace approach. Please be Godric. It's not Godric. But I would much rather fight a very powerful beast than go anywhere near that gargoyle fight again. After a very long fight, which I was so close to throwing at the last minute, I got him. And as well as dropping a whole bunch of runes in another stroke of luck, he dropped both of the great runes I needed to get into Lane Dell. In the very first part of the capital, I was ecstatic to find a small shield for upgraded parries and weight. So what was Lane Dell like? The rooftop actually looks pretty clear, so this shouldn't be too bad. Ah, the two most aggressive enemies in the game. Yay. Oh, an Elden Beast for good measure. I'm usually pretty nervous crossing these rooftops because of the imps, but this was a whole new level of fear.
the next couple of areas were also pretty terrifying. But mercifully, Godfrey was small moose. Bit tanky, but not a problem. And as I went into Morgoth's arena, I got the answer to the question that most of you are probably asking. Yep, here she is. I was actually kind of hoping that she'd show up in one of the smaller arenas so I could try out some fancy waterfowl strats, but Morgoth's arena means that this fight played out as usual. Because of the plus six, this was probably the longest Melania fight I've done on this channel, even more than R01. But at least her standard attacks weren't one-shotting me here. Now I wanted to get into Volcano Manor, and again there was an issue. Tanith doesn't give you the drawing room key, and I hadn't encountered it despite going to every location I could possibly think of. So I decided to take a peek into the randomizer's log files. These will tell you the region an item is located if you get stuck. And the reason I hadn't found it was apparently it was in the shunning grounds, which meant that it had to be behind what is usually the Moog fight. Now the good news with the sewers, the randomizer can't possibly put anything on the pipes that's more annoying than the imps. Okay, I'd like to retract that statement. Much, much later, I was running through all of the pipes on my way down to Moog. And there were enough Rikards and Fire Giants stuck in these pipes to bring my PC to its knees. This wasn't the highlight of the run, but I eventually made it down. And my only hope for Moog's very small arena was that there wouldn't be anything too big in here. Joy. Many minutes of screaming later, the Lich Dragon was down and I had the drawing room key. In place of Noble, there was first phase Rikard. With the Lance, this was very easy, and the camera was a lot kinder than the earlier Rikard encounter. In Rikard's arena, I found Big Moose. This guy wasn't a problem, but the fight took nearly 10 minutes as he just kept healing. So I was really hoping for Godric in phase two. It wasn't Godric. And if there was ever a time where I needed to pull a no-hit Moog fight out of nowhere, it was here. Which, shockingly, is what happened. Now to the rolled lift, where I encountered the next problem. Now as the rolled medallion was another single item that I didn't want to spend hours looking for, I once again took a peek at the log files, and I'm bloody glad that I did, because it was in the consecrated snowfield. So to get it, I needed both halves of the Halig Tree medallion. I'd already found one, and apparently, the other one was in the Urnia, which meant it had to be in the only important location I hadn't searched, Magma Worm Macar. In place of Magma Worm was Fire Giant Phase 1, which was a very easy fight compared to the last few. This 
Then I could head through the snowfield. And the only possible location for the rolled medallion in the snowfield was the golden seed tree outside of Aldenar Town. So I went and grabbed it before heading through the mountaintops to Fire Giant. Fire Giant was Astal. And this was the first fight where I really started feeling my plus six weapon was holding me back. Relatively low damage and the fact that I was getting one shot meant that this felt like fighting the snowfield Astal rather than the normal one. It was rough, but I managed to get through. And phase two was an even more tanky and dangerous Elden Beast. At least I had Torrent to escape Elden Stars. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go to the Halig Tree. And I didn't take this decision lightly. The Haley Tree is the highest scaled area in Elden Ring. So whatever had replaced Loretta and Melania would likely be the most dangerous bosses I'd face on this run. But again, if it was Margit and Godric, I could get some easy levels before going back to Astor and Elden Beast. I'd been particularly worried about this tree section since the start of the game. But actually, it was fine. In fact, pretty much all of this area was fine. I ran through it first try without any deaths or memes. Perhaps my luck was changing. Perhaps the randomizer was, oh, for fuck's sake. Ah, I knew you'd come to stand before the Elden Ring, to become Elden Lord. Yes. Gideon with more than double the health he has in vanilla with a plus six weapon. Now this playthrough marks my 30th playthrough of Elden Ring on this channel. And when you play a game 30 times, 30 different ways, your opinions on stuff changes a lot. Bosses that you struggled with at the start can become far more simple and less annoying than they once were. And when you're making YouTube videos about your playthroughs, sometimes you can start exaggerating a bit for comedic effect. Because of this, I think it's important to tell you, dear viewers, that I still truly, deeply fucking hate this guy. But despite everything that this randomizer was throwing at me, I was having fun. An old wanky McSpam a lot wasn't gonna get in my way. With surely the worst part of the run over, I headed through Elphiel, which was mostly fine. There was some swearing trying to get past an Astal that had set up camp in the Rot Swamp, but it wasn't too bad. Finally, I made it down to Melania's arena. And honestly, this absolutely cracked me up. Even when you randomize this game, it still feels like Miyazaki is behind the wheel. If you'd asked me at the start of this run to pick two bosses who I really wouldn't want to be in the Halig tree, I would have undoubtedly said Red Wolf and Gideon. After a very long and careful fight, Red Wolf was down and I had a whole bunch of runes to level up with. I took this back to the fire giant fight and was finally able to get past Elden Beast.
In Faram, I discovered that the ancient dragon here had shrunk significantly. And killing him gave me my second talisman of the run, which I promptly equipped. And just up the road, I found the somber seven that had eluded me for so long. Having already picked up an eight, this allowed me to get my weapon to plus eight. In Duo's arena, I found Halig Tree Loretta. This was gonna be fine. What the fuck is happening here? Is that... Oh... Right, so it turns out that there's a very angry fire giant up there on the balcony. So this fight was actually a little harder as I had to keep Loretta right against the back of the arena to prevent us from aggroing the big man. On my way through the rest of Farum, I found a somber 9 and 10 and finally upgraded my weapon to max. Now, what absolute abomination would be in place of the Draconic Tree Sentinel? This was going to suck and I knew it. In Malaketh's arena, I found Morgoth, and because I'd forgotten that this was a two-phase fight, I decided to go for parries with a small shield, which left me with not many hills at all for phase two, but I was confident it would be Godric. That is not Godric. And that is a massive problem. Yeah, when he jumps up for the meteor attack, you have no idea where it's gonna come from. So all I could do was reserve more heals on the Morgoth fight and hope that the meteor wasn't a one shot. Okay, home stretch. And for the first time playing this game, I didn't walk up these stairs full of dread. For the first time, I knew that I wasn't about to be bombarded by relentless spell spam. For the penultimate fight, I got Noble. And while I wasn't worried one bit at first, fighting this guy in an arena where you have nothing to hide behind for the rolls, and him dealing this much damage, is actually a complete nightmare. The roll is really tough to iframe with a medium roll. And while I did find a way to roll out and strafe it, it required a perfectly timed dodge to the side, and getting hit by the first roll almost certainly meant death. The second boss was Magma Worm Makar, and while a couple of his attacks were one-shots, and I don't know his moveset well at all, Noble killed me far more times due to that stupid roll attack. And now for the finale. Who will it be? It was Nile. Now I can't remember the last time that I died to Nile on a standard build guide. But him being here really was a problem. Unlike the vanilla fight, both the banished knights spawn on top of each other behind him. 
so there's no way to take out the dual wielding one while he spawns in. And both of the knights are incredibly strong and tanky. The dual wield guy probably killed me half a dozen times before I got the fight down to two enemies. And by the time I'd managed to get rid of the second, they'd taken over half of my heals every time. But when I'd finally got past the start of the fight and was working down Niall's massive health bar, I realized I'd be going into the final fight with only three or four heals. And I was actually quite excited. Whatever was in Elden Beast's arena would likely have more health and do more damage than anything else I'd encountered on this run. But I'd been keeping score. There were only five possible options for what boss it could be. Margit, Godric, Godfrey or Malekith. All of which I am very confident with. If it was any of these guys, I wouldn't need many heals, if any. The worst case scenario was Plassey. But even then, I beat Plassey not so long ago with a rock build at RL1. On every attempt, Niall was going to take all of my heals, but I knew I could pull something special out of the bag for the final fight, so that didn't matter. After everything that this randomizer had thrown at me, it was time to finish strong. first Elden Ring randomizer. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, consider giving it a like and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring shenanigans. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.